very good morning and uh, welcome to you all. And a special welcome if you're perhaps a visitor. We've got a few visitors here this morning. We do hope you'll feel very much at home here at St. John's. And just to remind you afterwards, we do have refreshments being served at the back and also some refreshments for the younger ones, which will be served over here at the front. So do stay around uh, for those. Let me uh, begin by reading some words from Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them and human beings that you care for them? Well, the song we're going to uh, sing in a moment is based on Psalm 8. It actually originates from Sweden, and it was very much a favorite hymn of the underground church in Sweden during the late 1800s, when Christians there were undergoing an awful lot of persecution. And as we sing the word, you'll see why this is a sort of hymn which is of tremendous encouragement and strength for those who are really undergoing trials. So let's stand and sing, O Lord, my God.
Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we bless and praise you that you are this great God. You are our creator, the creator of a vast and glorious and wonderful universe. But Lord, we praise you that you're also our redeemer. And Lord to God, we pray that this morning as we gather in your name as your people, Father, our minds will be expanded to comprehend more of your glory and your greatness. And our hearts will be enlarged to embrace your faithfulness. And so we will leave this place saying, how great thou art. Amen. Well, please do be seated. Good morning, everybody. I would like to tell you about uh, um, something coming up in the summer. So this year, we're going to be holding two holiday clubs here in St. John's Church. Uh, these are jointly done with Riverside Church, and they're open to anybody at primary school. So they're both going to be here. The, the theme is Treasure Hunters, and Treasure Hunters Week 1 will be the first week of the summer holidays, which is Tuesday the 26th to the uh, Friday the 29th of July. And then Treasure Hunters Week 2 will be the last week of the summer holidays, which is Tuesday the 30th of August to Friday the 2nd of September. And they're setting up on the Mondays before both clubs. So we're looking for teams to help at either or both of them. And there are lots of different ways that you could get involved, including working with the children in a small group. But if that thought doesn't appeal, then running a game or preparing a craft or making refreshments or welcoming parents or the tech stuff that has to go on and making scenery beforehand, all different ways of, that you could be involved. So please have a think about this. There are two training evenings, Monday the 13th of June and uh, the 11th of July, for those who are going to be working with the children. And you will need to have had a DBS check as well if you're going to be working with the children. And so the clubs are a brilliant opportunity to share the gospel with children and be part of a team and have a great time. So uh, please talk to me if you'd uh, like to have more information or if you'd like to put your name down uh, to be part of them. So we're looking forward to those summer clubs. And then I'll, I've also got the Colin tickets uh, if you'd like to get some tickets about the Colin concert that I talked about last week. Now, uh, this morning is a little bit of a change again. So the creche are back in the creche room. Uh, so when they go for the, take the children out, the creche are going to go that way, to the, by the toilet, the creche room there. And if they're older children moving around, um, Dave said he's going to go outside. So take your coat with you, just for a little game. Okay? And then the rest of us, the 3 to 14-year-olds, we're all going to go that way still, all together to the to the. Um, bottom floor of the NCC, the scramblers go to the middle floor as normal, and then when we've done it all together a bit, the climbers are going to stay in the NCC on the bottom floor, the uh, explorers are going to go to the hall, and pathfinders are going to go to the vicarage. <sighs> what are we doing? <laughs> That's more important. So, uh, this morning, the scramblers are looking at how important it is to listen to Jesus, and they're looking at the story, story of Mary and Martha. And in the Climbers, Explorers and Pathfinders, we're looking at how God chose David to be the next king. Let's pray before we go. Our God, how great thou art. Thank you that you are a great God. And thank you that you care about us. And in all our different comings and goings this morning and the changes that are happening, we pray we wouldn't lose sight of the fact that we're learning about you the great God that you are. I pray for the children in the creche that they would be settled in their new room and that um, all the children learning this morning will be able to concentrate and listen and that your spirit will teach them in their heart about you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's go to our rooms.
As no, uh, many of you will know, over the last few weeks we've been praying for our dear brother uh, Paul Clark. Uh, well, on Wednesday morning the Lord called Paul home uh, to himself, and uh, we rejoice with him in his uh, glorious entry into heaven. Uh, we share our thoughts and our prayers with uh, Gillian and also Hannah and Dave and the family. So uh, let us, uh, as we pray a little later on, we'll hold them in our prayers especially. Uh, but we do want to thank God for Paul's faithful witness over the years, uh, for his uh, strong faith and uh, the, the goodness that the Lord continually showed towards him. And the psalmist uh, continues to remind us that it's our own mortality that we must face, and this should cause us to order our days aright. And with that in mind, we come before our Lord now and to confess our sins before him. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Saying together, Lord, we have not obeyed your word, nor heeded what is written in the scriptures. We repent with all our heart and humble ourselves before you. In your mercy, forgive us, grant us your peace and the strength to keep your laws through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We now turn to the word of God. reading from chapter 8, verse 1. Chapter 8, verse 1 of Exodus. Seven days passed after the Lord struck the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord says, Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and your bedroom and onto your bed, into the houses of your officials and all your people, and into your ovens and kneading troughs. The frogs will come up on you and your people and all your officials. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and canals and ponds and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and frogs came up and covered the land. But the magicians did the same things by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people, and I will let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people, that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs, except for those that remain in the Nile. Tomorrow, Pharaoh said. Moses replied, it will be as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will leave your land and houses, your officials and your people. They will remain only in the Nile. After Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh, Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs he had brought on Pharaoh. And the Lord did what Moses asked. The frogs died in the houses, in the courtyards, and in the fields. They were piled up into heaps, and the land reeked of them. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground, and throughout the land of Egypt the dust will become gnats. They did this 
And when Aaron stretched out his hand with a staff and struck the dust of the ground, gnats came upon people and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. Since the gnats were on people and animals everywhere, the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen, just as the Lord had said. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now the uh, next song we're going to sing is also based on a psalm, this time Psalm 91, which speaks of the quiet confidence the believer can have in the security that God provides. But stand and sing. Please do be seated for our second reading. The second reading is slightly changed from your um, sheets. It's Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 to 35. It's on page 66. Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh, and say to him, This is what the Lord God of the Hebrews says. Let my people go, so that they may worship me. Or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you and your officials and your people, so you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. But I've raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. You still set yourself against my people and will not let them go. Therefore, at this time tomorrow, I will send the worst hailstorm that has ever fallen on Egypt. 
from the day it was founded till now. Give an order now to bring your livestock and everything you have in the field to a place of shelter, because the hail will fall on every person and animal that has not been brought in and is still out in the field, and they will die. Those officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord hurried to bring their slaves and their livestock inside. But those who ignored the word of the Lord left their slaves and livestock in the field. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand towards the sky so that the hail will fall all over Egypt, on people and animals and on everything growing on the fields of Egypt. When Moses stretched out his staff towards the sky, the Lord sent thunder and hail and lightning flashed down to the ground. So the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. Hail fell and lightning flashed back and forth. It was the worst storm in all the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. Throughout Egypt, hail struck everything in the fields, both people and animals. It beat down everything growing in the fields and stripped every tree. The only place it did not hail was the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. This time I have sinned, he said to them. The Lord is the right and my people are in the wrong. Pray to the Lord, for we have had enough thunder and hail. I will let you go. You don't have to stay any longer. Moses replied, When I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands in prayer to the Lord. The thunder will stop, and there will be no more hail, so you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But I know that you and your officials still do not fear the Lord God. The flax and the barley were destroyed, since the barley was in the ear and the flax was in bloom. The wheat and spelt, however, were not destroyed, because they ripen later. Then Moses left Pharaoh and went out of the city. He spread out his hands towards the Lord. The thunder and hail stopped, and the rain no longer poured on the land. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had stopped, he sinned again. He and his officials hardened their hearts. So Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not let the Israelites go, just as the Lord had said through Moses. This is the word of the Lord. A couple of weeks ago, we had the annual church meeting here, and uh, our two church wardens were elected, uh, Tim Benstead and Peter Burney. And, uh, and so it's only right and appropriate, required, that they do declare their commitment to this particular and very special office in the church. So I'm going to ask uh, Tim and Pete if they'll come forward and uh, to make their declarations, and then we're going to pray for them. I solemnly and sincerely declare before God and his people that I will faithfully and diligently discharge the duties of the office of church warden for the parish for which I have been chosen during the period of my appointment and that I will present to the bishop such matters or persons as to my knowledge should be presented. Well, shall we bow our heads and uh, pray for Tim and Pete? Dear Lord, we thank you that within the body of Christ you've all given us different gifts and uh, we have different callings, but all to that same end of glorifying Christ and serving your people. Uh, we do thank you for Tim and Pete for their witness to you, uh, for saving them, and Lord, for their dedication to you and to your people in this place. We do ask that in the coming year your Holy Spirit would so strengthen and anoint them uh, that they will prove to be good role models within the church and to discharge these duties of which they've just solemnly declared. For your name's sake, amen. Thank you. And I also uh, published the, mar uh, the Bands of Marriage between Scott Nolan and Carla Lambert and between Ian Baker and Diane Leeson. Uh, this is for the third time of asking and also between Raymond Milthorpe and Pauline Corrick, and this is for the first time of asking. 
And if any of you know any reason in law why these persons may not lawfully marry, then you're to declare uh, that now. Uh, you were given notices as you came in. Okay, so please do uh, take those home. There's a lot of things coming up, as you can see. Um, very important meeting on Wednesday. It's our central uh, prayer meeting. And uh, it was announced at the annual meeting that uh, Leo McMahon, who's the minister, uh, our minister up at Riverside and St. Faith, will be leaving in uh, April of next year. And so this is a very important time, obviously, for praying for those two churches especially as we look forward uh, to future leadership there. So do come along on Wednesday at 8 o'clock and, uh, and join us for that time of prayer. Um, we'll also see uh, there, there are various evangelistic activities coming up soon. Uh, on May the 20th, there's a men's games night. And that's on the 20th. There we are, men's games night. And uh, that's, a, again, a great opportunity, inviting folk along. It's an opportunity just to get to know folk, to relate with them, and share the gospel. And then the following day, we have a special Queen's Tea Party. Now, unfortunately, Her Majesty can't make it to be with us. Uh, I'm sure she'll be with us in spirit, as it were. And, uh, and we, we are thankful that God has given us such a wonderful queen. And, uh, and so we thought, again, let's use this opportunity to celebrate that and uh, to point to the Savior that uh, Her Majesty also knows and, and declares. So um, please make a mental note of that. We'll be hearing more of that uh, next week. Okay. Um, all right. All well, the notices there, so please, as I said, just do take them and do read them. Well, let's uh, now stand and sing as we declare our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as our one and only Savior.
So as we remain standing, we're going to declare our faith in the great triune God in the words of our creed. We believe in one God and Father, from him all things come. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, through him we come to God. We believe in one Holy Spirit, in him we are baptized into one body. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let us pray. As we pray, do pick up your service sheet and look at the Lord's Prayer at the bottom of the page. These words are so familiar with, to us that it's easy just to say them without thinking, and it helps if we follow them and personalize them as we pray. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I was once in darkness. Now my eyes can see. I was lost, but Jesus sought and found me. Thank you, Lord, for the certainty of the hope we have as Christians. Certainty that we have our sins forgiven and a future beyond the grave. Certainty that your justice will prevail and triumph in our sin-sick world because you, the Almighty, the one true great creator God, have revealed these things to us. Today, Lord, we do pray that you will comfort and encourage the friends and family of Paul Clark that in their loss they will find new strength and hope in that same certainty. We pray that you would sustain, in fact, all those in our church family who are sick and struggling. Particularly, we remember Roger and Angus, that they would know your peace as they wait for treatment and that you would grant to them and others the restoration they long for. In our world, Lord, we remember that down the centuries, great empires have come and gone at your decree. So we pray particularly for the desperate situations in Syria and Yemen, that you would bring wicked men, wicked men in leadership to their knees, that you would strengthen and protect those seeking to bring peace and aid, and that you would build your church in these lands so that the people with no hope may find lasting hope in you. Particularly this week, Lord, we pray that the people in Aleppo may find relief. We remember too, Lord, that there are many peoples in the world who have never heard the good news of the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for them and is risen. Lord, we pray for those seeking to share that good news and for those who facilitate the sharing. In particular, today, we lift up the Missionary Aviation Fellowship who fly missionaries and supplies to remote spots, that you would protect their pilots and planes and that you would guide their leaders to make good and wise strategic decisions. We pray for our own Dave and Jen Pett in Australia, training pilots, that you would particularly help Dave in, as he assesses different needs and delivers programs appropriate to the situations locally. We pray as well that you'd bless Jen and the boys as they build relationship and service for you in Cairns. Back here at home, Lord, we bring our city to you and the elections next Thursday for council and a police commissioner. 
We pray that men and women of integrity and ability would be appointed. Men and women who will be open to promotion of the values you lay out in your word. Particularly, Lord, we pray for the vast areas of our city with no effective gospel witness. Lord, would you raise up a new generation of church planters willing to spend themselves in your service to reach the lost. And please, Lord, show us our place in making this happen. We pray too, Lord, for our current outreach initiatives, for friends from other lands who come to our ESL sessions, for residents at Grove House across the road, for the men coming to our games nights and the folk who will come to the party for the Queen, for the mums who join us for mini music. Lord, we pray that many of these dear ones will find Christ for themselves whilst being with us and then go on to become committed disciples. Grant us all, Lord, courage and initiative in reaching out that we may recognise opportunities so that your name would be glorified by seeing family, friends and colleagues coming to Christ. These things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we were having those readings from Exodus, we heard a lot about a hard heart uh, that exemplified by Pharaoh. Uh, no greater condemnation can there be then for such a thing. And it is our hearts as a malleable in God's hands as we hear his word that pleases him and does us good. So as we prepare to hear that word, let's uh, sing our next song, which is also a prayer for a change in our hearts. Father, we do indeed pray that our hearts will be changed by you to see you for who you are and that that will elicit in us great praise for you are indeed the mighty deliverer. Amen. Please do be seated and do turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter well, 7 through to 10. I'm going to attempt to do all... Um, the plays and give you a bit of an overview. I won't be able to go into the depth 
I think we could on each, each one, but certainly give us an overview of these uh, nine plagues. Sometimes adverts um, stick in your mind, don't they? Because either they're clever or funny or they touch the emotions. I particularly like this one when Nestle did it for Kit Kat. Um, you know, their slogan, have a break, have a Kit Kat. And they just changed benches uh, into um, open Kit Kats. I thought that was um, good. But I particularly like um, this one as well, this poster for a live music battle run by a radio st station. The event that they run is called Settling the Score, uh, and the guy behind the ad chose two well-known musical scores and brought them to life in this battle um, scene. I just thought it was brilliant, thought very, very um, clever. Now, as you've seen over um, our studies in Exodus, that the Lord is certainly going to settle the score with Pharaoh, and it's not going to be music um, to the ears of the um, Egyptians. In Exodus 1, we saw how God's creation purposes, remember, the Israelites were increasing and being fruitful in number, and those creation purposes are opposed by Pharaoh's anti-family plan, where he wants to stop them from having male children. Then last week in Exodus 5 and 6, we heard how Pharaoh opposed God's plan to have a people who would worship him by keeping them working in Egypt. All the time, God has purposes and plans, and Pharaoh stands against them. And last week, I spoke about how it began with this war of words, and now the war of words has turned to a war of works. The Lord is going to settle the score in Egypt. Indeed, a mighty hand is going to come in order to compel Pharaoh to let the people go. Why? Because God will always rise up in judgment of those who set themselves against his creation purposes. So before we look at each particular plague and the purpose of the plagues, I wanted to look at the pattern of the plagues as a whole. These plagues um, are ordered within the narrative in a specific way to teach vital lessons and to make God's point. There's going to be an almighty battle, and this first sign, it's not a plague, but the first sign with the staffs and the snakes tells us who's going to win up front. This has got to be one of the greatest spoilers in the history um, of the world. Just as Aaron's snake devours the snake of the magicians, chapter 7, verse 12, so we are alerted to the fact that God is going to devour the gods of Egypt through these plagues that are going to come. The serpent of the garden, the devil, and the serpent who rules Egypt, Pharaoh, will not win against the God of all creation. Now, why do I say the serpent who rules Egypt? Well, of course, you'll be familiar from the statue of Tutankhamun that he wore a serpent upon his head as a sign of his authority over Egypt. So much so that in Ezekiel chapter 29, he's referred to by the prophet as that great serpent, that great sea monster, serpent of the sea, the king of Egypt. God will crush the serpents who oppose his creation purposes. But before we get to any plague, God shows through the throwing down of the staffs that the authority of Pharaoh over his people is done with. With the throwing down of the staffs, we have the throwing down of a gauntlet that Pharaoh will pick up, but he will lose the battle. There's a distinct pattern in these first nine plagues. The nine plagues can be grouped into a series of three contests, each contest having three plagues of their own. Broadly speaking, plagues one to three produce discomfort. The next three plagues show greater damage and destruction in Egypt. And the final three plagues produce the added dimension of downright dread in Egypt. Never have we seen anything like this, even from its beginning. See, the first plague in each 
series, that's um, 1, 4, and 7. They begin with this expression, in the morning. In the morning, Moses goes with a warning. And then the last plague in each sequence, 3, 6, and 9, there is no warning. The plague comes upon them. What do we see here? We see God's patience. Even in the ordering of the plagues, God gives people an opportunity. First one in the series, a warning. Final one in the series, no warning. But God is patient even with his enemies. Another pattern, the Egyptian magicians. It's quite hard to say I've been practicing that. The plagues begin with these Egyptian magicians. They imitate the miracles, don't they? Then they themselves admit, uh, when he gets to one of the miracles, that this is the finger of God. They can't actually imitate it. But then they themselves are afflicted by the miracles when it comes to the boils, and they can't even come before Moses. So you have this movement, this pattern, where they imitate, then they admit it's the finger of God, and then they themselves are afflicted. The officials of Pharaoh, they're another group in the passage. Uh, to begin with, none of them listen. But then they heed Moses' warning to bring in the cattle and the slaves. Some of them do anyway. But then the time you get to chapter 12, all the officials are coming to Pharaoh and begging with him that they allow the Egyptians to leave. So you have this pattern that they move from non-respond to the warnings, some respond to the warning, then all of them are terrified and saying, let's get rid of these people. What does this show us? This shows us God's persistence. We always see this. God persists uh, with people. He persists in getting people's attention. God is displaying himself to the Israelites as one who is not only patient, but also persistent with the rebellious. In the first series of plagues, there's no mention of a separation between the Israelites and the Egyptians when it comes to experiencing the plagues. But in the second and the third series, a distinct separation is either clearly made or implied they are separated um, off. They do not experience, the Hebrews don't experience the plagues. What is this teaching? That God is passionate about his people. Throughout the ordering of the plagues, we see that God is passionate about his people and passionate about protecting them. This really matters to us now as the people of God, this side of the cross and resurrection of Christ. It matters to us that we know that we have a God who is patient with people, a God who is persistent with the rebellious, and if he is that way with his enemies, because that's how he displayed himself to the Egyptians, then how much so will he be with his people who he is passionate about protecting them? That is the God that we worship. See, there are patterns that develop with these plays that teach us lessons, lessons about God's patience and Persistence with the rebellious and about his passion and protection of his people. But now let's turn to the plagues in particular. And I want to run through um, all nine quite quickly. It's good to ask a question when you're reading the Bible. What is the point? What did, this, what did this mean to the people of God then? And what is it supposed to mean to us? This is a battle. This is a great battle scene. It's supposed to get their hearts beating and pumping when they see that God annihilates the gods of Egypt. Look at plague one. The Nile turns into blood. The Nile was literally the lifeblood of Egypt. Without the Nile, they wouldn't be able to, to live. It turned what would have been a desert region into, into a fertile land either side of the Nile. Listen to these words from, um, it's called the Hymn of the Nile. It's from 2100 BC. Here's what they wrote. Hail to thee, O Nile, who manifests thyself over this land and comes to give life to all Egypt, watering the orchards created by Ra to cause all the cattle to live. You give to the earth to drink, O oh, inexhaustible one. There was the Nile, the lifeblood of Egypt, and gods of the Niles that they worship. And God fills the Nile, the lifeblood of Egypt, with blood. Nil to the gods of the Nile, one point to the god of the Hebrews. Look at plague two, um, the frogs. 
the Egyptian um, goddess Heket. Um, she had the form of a woman and the head um, of a, a frog. Uh, and then you get this plague of frogs. Now, of course, if this was in France, it would be okay because they just eat them all up. But this is not France. This is Egypt. And frogs are sacred. And so you can't um, touch them. It was said of Heket that out of her nostrils came the breath of life to Egypt and the Egyptians. She is the aroma of life to Egypt. And God takes the aroma of life and he makes it the stench of death. The smell of these heaped up frogs around Egypt was putrid. That's what we read. The result so far? 2-0 to the God Yahweh. Plague 3, um, the gnats, chapter 8, verse 16 to 19. This is the first plague that the Egyptian uh, magicians cannot perform, even though they tried, verse 18. Why can they not perform it? Because there is only one person who can take the dust of the ground and bring life out of it, Genesis chapter 2. 3-0 to the creator God. Another Egyptian God bites the dust. Plague 4, the, the flies. The, this is the first plague where the Lord makes a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. Now, when you get a fly in your house, one of our big things in summer, flies come into the house and you're trying to get them out and you open doors and you open windows and you try and shoot with a piece of paper, but you can't tell it what to do, can you? Flies don't fly where you tell them to, unless... You're the God of all creation. And then you can say to flies, I want you here, but you can't go to Goshen. That's the power of God. The Lord of the flies shows himself to be Lord of the skies. And the Egyptian gods, or so-called gods, who are gods of the skies, are brought to nothing. For to the God of the Israelites, nil to the gods of the Egyptians. Plague Five, the livestock are killed, chapter 9, first seven verses. Animals were sacred in Egypt. The bull represented the god Apis. The cow represented Hathor, the goddess of love, joy, and beauty. And Canum was a ram god. What does God do? He brings the domesticated animals to their knees, just like he brings the domesticated gods of the Egyptians to their knees. He's crippling Egypt stage by stage, and in so doing, he's showing how crippled their gods are. Five nil to Yahweh. They're getting absolutely thrashed. Plague six, boils. The Egyptians worshipped um, Sekhmet, a, a lion-headed goddess of war with alleged power over diseases and healing. I find this comical. She's the goddess of um, diseases and healings, and here they are, full of boils. I wonder if their boils burst as they were worshipping Sekhet, saying, please deliver us from the diseases. Please deliver us from these plagues. But they couldn't even bow because they were so crippled by boils. The magicians cannot rid the land of Egypt of the boils. In fact, they slow, so inflicted themselves that they can't come before Moses. These people who started imitating are now immobilized, crushed under the mighty hand of God. The Israelites should be chanting by now. As they read this later on in their history, they're meant to be thinking as it gets to this stage, six, no, six, no. Do you get it? This is what it's about. This is how we're to feel the narrative. God is the victor. He's crushing the gods of the Egyptians that stood over the land. Plague 7, the, the storm. What do we sing? Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow. And then the Egyptians have the goddess Nut. And what can she do? Nothing. God commands the lightning and the hail and the rain. She was supposed to be over Egypt, protecting her. She dominated the skies. And now God dominates her and crushes her under his feet. Seven nil to the Lord. Plague eight, the, the locusts. 
We're told in chapter 10, verses 1 to 2, God says to Moses that this plague will give them something to tell their grandchildren about. It will give them something to sing about, to recount at their family gatherings or the meals as they remember God's great victory in Egypt. Who knows? Maybe they made up song about the locust. Remember? There was the locust and, and they then plundered Egypt. They took the jewels of Egypt from them as people gave it. Maybe they said at a song called Three Locusts on the Shirts, Jewels Remain Still Gleaming. Who, who knows? But what's happening here is that God says, I'm going to give you something to sing about. You won't be embarrassed about the plagues. You'll rejoice in them because you're seeing God's mighty hand of power. Plague 9, the, the darkness. This plague is aimed at um, one of the chief Egyptian um, deities, the sun god Ra. Uh, Pharaoh himself was the earthly representation. Ra was responsible for pro producing sunlight and, uh, and warmth and, and productivity. And now... Ra is out for the count, carried off the pitch for three days as God plunges Egypt into darkness, darkness that you could feel because it was so thick. Throughout a, a series of nine plagues, the Lord has brought Egypt to its knees. He's mocked Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, who sits on the throne. He's humiliated the gods of Egypt that have... Um, authority over certain territories or so they believed. Nine nil. That's the scoreline. It's a massive defeat for Egypt. It's a great victory for the Lord. Well, having looked at the pattern of the plagues and each plague in particular, what was the purpose of the plagues? What's the purpose Last week, if you hear, you'll remember that I said God would deliver his people from working for Pharaoh in order to worship him. But the big question that we're asked and we get to um, ponder in chapter 5 and 6 is whether the people's hearts are ready for that transition. Whether they're ready for the transition from working for Pharaoh to worshiping the Lord. And the plagues are to make their hearts ready. The plagues are not just about getting Pharaoh's heart ready to release them as God compels him with a mighty hand. No, God, as you've seen throughout the narrative, it's very clear that God is in control of Pharaoh's heart. No, what God is doing is giving the Hebrews, the Israelites, content to that name they have received, Yahweh. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. He's given content to the name that they will worship. It's important for them to know who Yahweh is. And they find out through these nine plagues something about who Yahweh is. How great and awesome he is. Sometimes we get into so much detail about the plagues. So much concern about what God was doing to Egypt. But we forget that it was to display his power. And we're meant to sit back in awe and majesty of this one who is raised above all the so-called gods of this earth. And comes with a crushing mighty hand. See, the plagues teaches that God orders and rules creation. Everything from the smallest gnat to the highest heaven is at his disposal. The Egyptians, they bowed down, as you've seen from the pictures, they bowed down to things uh, in nature. God bends nature in order to do his bidding. <laughs> that sets him up as supreme over the gods of Egypt. The Ad Egyptian gods had... So many, many gods, each with their own little jurisdiction over a certain um, area. And so none of them demanded complete loyalty, just partial loyalty in certain areas. And we worship the one who commands all of creation from the dust to the stars. And he says, and thus I demand complete loyalty from you, every ounce and fiber of your being. The plagues teach us that God is mighty to save. At primary school, I won't say her name, but we had a, a teacher, and she had such a strong, vicious prod, and that we used to tell um, younger children that when you got to the clash, that she'd actually impaled children upon her finger, okay? She was so vicious, she used to prod you uh, in the chest. People say it was bad, but they, people behaved in her class. 
And witnessing the plagues, the magicians say, this is the finger of God. With a finger, God floods the Nile with blood. With a finger, he floods cities with frogs. The land with gnats and flies. With a finger, boils appear on the body. Hail appears from the sky. Why is this important? Remember, it's about God's power. If we don't grasp that he is powerful enough to empty the skies of hail, we will not believe that he is powerful enough to empty a tomb of a body or to empty every tomb of everybody. It matters that God does this. It matters that he is powerful and majestic because our salvation depends on it. The Israelite salvation depended upon it. We worship a God who is mighty to save. The plagues teach us that God is passionate about his people's rescue. As I said, time and time again, we read that God makes a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. His eyes are upon his people for their good. Because of his covenant, that contract of love, loving faithfulness to his people, God is mindful of his people, and he draws a circle of protection around them in the midst of judgment. So they will bring them out of Egypt. We worship a God who is passionate about his people. Let me ask you a question. At this stage, and for these rights, who wouldn't want to turn from the puny gods of the Egyptians and the puny, pathetic gods of this world that we construct to worship the Lord? The one who stands not as part of his creation, but over all the creation, every bit of it. Who wouldn't want to worship the one who controls the river and the rains, the livestock, the lightning, the locust? Who wouldn't want to worship the one who commands frogs and flies? Who wouldn't want to worship the one who can stand up and say to the wind and the waves, quiet, be still? Who wouldn't want to worship the one who can say to the fish of the seas, go now to my disciples' nets, so that they're filled to overflowing. Who wouldn't want to worship that God? Who wouldn't want to worship and bow down to the one before whose nail-pierced hands we saw the finger of God to crush that ancient serpent? Who wouldn't want to worship such a God? Is he not worthy of all our praise who has taken upon himself all the plagues of God's wrath, including the deepest darkness the world has ever seen upon the cross? And in, in the midst of that judgment, drawn a circle of protection around his people so that they will be secured from the coming wrath. Who wouldn't want to worship such a God? The plagues turn hearts that are prone to wander into hearts that are pleased to worship. That's what they did for Israel. That was their purpose for them. And that is their glorious purpose for us too. Let us pray. Almighty God, we recognize that we are so prone to forget your power and control. Our thoughts about you are too human, too small, too meager, too pathetic. And therefore, our hearts easily wander. And we're not filled with the, the joy, pleasure, and delight that they could be in worship. Gracious Father, we ask now that an understanding of these pl plagues will elicit in us greater worship of you, the sovereign God, and greater worship of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has drawn a circle of protection around his people that they might be sheltered from the coming wrath. Or may we indeed lift our hearts and voices and offer up our lives as living sacrifices in worship of you.
Amen. Now the uh, final hymn we're going to be singing now, uh, ask that God would act in this land that for the, uh, to restore the honor and the glory of his name. And during the singing of this hymn, we're going to take a collection for the spread of the gospel. Let's stand and sing. Jesus God and Father, we thank you that there is no shadow of turning with you, that your power is not diminished, your passion for your people remains intense and true. And Lord, we pray that indeed you would uh, work in our land and in our lives for the fame of your great and glorious name. We long for many more to come to know you. We long for that true and humble discipleship before you. And so, Lord, we pray that as we go out in your name, that we would live in the light of the truths we've been hearing of this morning, and all to the praise and glory of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please do be seated. <clears throat> 